Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our final school law webinar of the 2022 calendar year. My name is Caitlin Atlas, and hosting with me today, who is on beneath me on my screen, but I don't know where she is on your screen, is Amy Dickerson. And we are pleased to join you today with our colleagues, Jennifer Smith, James Petrangaro, and Adam da Doskus, which I may be pronouncing somewhat correctly, for a conversation about some recent legal developments from the fall 2022 school term. All right, well, we're very happy to have everyone here with us today. So thanks for joining us. We know it is a um, busy, busy time of the year. Um, before we do begin, we want to remind everyone that we are live on Zoom today, so do please feel free to submit questions through the Q&A feature. We will keep our eye on your questions throughout our time together um, and we'll try to address any that we have certainly by the end um, before we close, but do know that we are going to be covering a lot of topics today, so do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us following today's webinar if you'd like to talk further about any of the topics that we have raised today. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. In the spirit of the season, we are going to be providing today sort of a holiday potpourri of school law updates. Um, we'll provide an overview of some recent legal updates in special education, Title IX, personnel issues related to sexual abuse prevention and responses in schools, as well as mental health litigation affecting employees, um, as well as some updates on two labor decisions. So with that, I will go ahead and I'm going to first turn it over to Caitlin um, to start us off with providing some updates on special education. Thanks, Amy. So I'm happy to talk about three topics today, and I know we only have limited time, so I will try and get through them quickly. The first is the guidance issued by the Office for Civil Rights and the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services. This was issued this summer, um, a fairly important set of guidance documents, but because many of us were on summer break, I think it somewhat slipped through the cracks a little bit. Um, so far this year, I personally am seeing a huge uptick in significant discipline cases that are leading to exclusionary discipline. And many of those cases do have a special education component in that there are students with either IEPs or Section 504 plans. That's I've seen more at the beginning of this school year than I think I ever have in the past. And historically, we always see a pretty significant uptick in these issues during the spring semester. So to that end, I do recommend that everybody take a look at this OCR and OSERS guidance. This guidance actually consists of several different guidance documents, and it was issued in July, and it specifically addresses the civil rights of students with disabilities specific to student discipline. The goal of these documents and the kind of underlying theme throughout them is the, the idea of minimizing exclusionary discipline, which is not new to us in Illinois based on Senate Bill 100, and really supporting the pandemic-related mental health needs of students and particularly those with disabilities. There's a lot of discussion in the documents of students coming back to school after spending a lot of time out of a traditional school setting in a an unprecedented time. I know everybody's tired of that word. And the mental health effects that we're starting to see trickle out from those. These documents help provide guidance on one, how we can minimize exclusionary discipline to avoid getting in those situations in the first place and alternatives to exclusionary discipline. And two, in the event that we are talking about a matter that requires exclusionary discipline, how we're doing it. So for students with Section 504 plans and IEPs, making sure if we need to, we're holding those manifestation determination review meetings. Um, considerations when we're talking about interim alternative educational settings, things like that. And as I mentioned earlier, there are several guidance documents that are part of this package, some of which are Q&A format, which I find really helpful as we are dealing with these situations more and more. Um, I will put Jennifer on the spot. Anything that you want to add on those documents that I missed? Well, one thing that has come out for some, some of my clients that's been an issue is they do highlight informal removals are suspensions. And they say it in a very technical way. One client asked me to identify where in this lengthy Q&A, and it's very technical, <laughs> technically written, I think. It's maybe more for our audience than the school audience. Although, you know, obviously anyone can read it. 
but basically they're getting at the point or they're getting to the point of um, if you send a kid home, you're, you're suspending that kid. That is a school chosen day out of school. And I think a lot of districts either, you know, because of all the complications with what it takes to suspend, not to mention parents sometimes prefer just a collaborative, let's take the kid home informally. That seems, feels better than you're being suspended. But the fact is under all these laws and the protection, school sends kid home, kid is suspended. And if you haven't documented that, you are probably running afoul of our state law, SB 100 and all of those requirements. And then this highlights, you're also running afoul of federal law and probably not doing your MDRs when you're supposed to and there's and, and maybe treating discriminatory. So, so that's the big thing that I see happen all the time. We are constantly doing informal removals that, that really made me nervous from the guidance. Yes, I can't reiterate that enough. And, and what I've seen recently, too, in the same vein is a school will call and say, we're spend, suspending your, your student for the remainder of the school day. And the parents will say, oh, no, you don't need to suspend. We'll just come pick them up. I still think that that is a suspension and we should document it as such, because otherwise you may be on the back end where you haven't documented those as suspensions, you haven't done your manifestation determination reviews, but the student has been excluded and you ultimately have changed their underlying placement because they've been out for so long. Mm -hmm. So take a look at those documents. We do have an article on our Special Ed Insights blog that's available on the Franzic website that kind of breaks down each of the different documents that was part of this guidance package. The next area I will address is the accessibility of translators during I, at school meetings. So as you all know, um, a year, two years ago, we received new guidance on qualified interpreters and the need to have qualified interpreters available for families who need them during IEP meetings. Over the summer, Public Act 102-1072 expanded that requirement and now interpretation services are required to be available not only at IEP meetings but also multidisciplinary consequences uh, co multidisciplinary conferences um, which I find is sometimes another word for an IEP meeting uh, 504 meetings which many schools were not doing before and at mediation sessions all of this makes sense right it's going to be very difficult to engage in mediation and have a parent meaningfully participate if they don't understand the underlying language in which the mediation is being conducted. But I do put that on your radar because I know two things. One, it it's not on everybody's radar. And two, it can be very difficult to find translators and interpreters. Um, so making sure we're planning ahead. So for the families who may need interpreters, making sure they're aware of their ability to request an interpreter. And if they need an interpreter, that we are planning ahead to schedule that person well enough in advance that it's not the morning of the meeting and we're saying, oh darn, we don't, we don't know how to find an interpreter at this late hour. And then finally, everybody in special ed's favorite topic, unapproved placements. So as you probably will recall, within the last calendar year, this has been a very hot topic in the area of special education, particularly in Illinois. There is a major shortage of approved, particularly residential placements, but day placements as well. Um, and as a result, we were getting in situations where we'd have a student with significant needs and we could not find anywhere on the list of ISBE approved placements to place that student. There were uh, a lot of letters that went back and forth between the Illinois Council of School Attorneys, the Illinois State Board of Education, IAASE, all around the beginning of this calendar year that resulted in emergency rules. And then ultimately it resulted in finalized rules later in the spring, early in the summer that were updated rules to allow for placements in non isbe approved special education facilities if very certain criteria are met. I am not going to go into the, the great detail of what those criteria are, but they are very specific and require significant documentation. So the good news is we have a little bit of flexibility to explore non-approved non placements now when we are in those really difficult situations with really high need students. The less good news is it is a very heavy 
a burden to meet to get to that unapproved placement. So we need to make sure you're looking at the regs, you're checking all the boxes, and you're keeping really, really good documentation of all the approved schools you've applied to, the reasons they've rejected the student, et cetera. I am more than happy to answer questions on any of those topics or any other uh, special education related topics towards the end of the webinar. But with that, I am going to turn it over to Jennifer um, to discuss another topic that's been on everybody's minds, and that is Title IX. Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about the status of these proposed Title IX regulations? Yes, so uh, everyone knows the during the Trump administration, they developed new, uh, new regulations that were ultimately implemented August 2020. Now we have um, regulations proposed by the Biden administration that would revise those Trump Trump uh, promulgated regulations. Um, one thing I would say, we never know, there's there's going to be differences between proposed and final, and it's sort of a fool's errand to guess what's gonna stay in, what's gonna come out. But broadly speaking, they build on the, the regulations. They were not, it's not a wholesale throwing out the framework of the Trump administration record, regulations are going completely back to what it was during the Obama administration, what procedure was expected. So it's, it's, I think we're building and not just throwing out. So um, that's one thing I would note. So in terms of, are we totally wasting our time and resources figuring out how to comply with the current regulations? You know, I don't think so. I think ultimately this is, this is the direction we're going and dealing with Title IX and it's just gonna be an evolution of that if these regulations are ultimately finalized. But anyway, so we do have proposed regulations. The process allows people then to comment on the regulations. Um, the administration received 240,000 comments, which is even double what they got on the controversial Trump uh, regulations, which is is pretty impressive. <laughs> That's so many. They got so many comments. So that then there's just an administrative process that needs to happen. Those have to be reviewed, considered, responded to. Um, in our last go around, it took 18 months for that full process from proposed to final, um, which I think in this case um, would take us into at least what late school year, summer essentially, if we're on the same timeline, which in my mind, I keep thinking that's essentially what's going to happen is we're going to get the final, maybe spring again, this is going to be everyone's summer, <laughs> summer school project, and um, there's going to be a scramble next school year to uh, implement. That may not be the case, it could take longer. And I don't know that we have telltale signs yet that we're moving far into the um, process where certainly anything's imminent. So I would describe them as still out there. Um, one thing to note is that what, what gets a lot of press coverage is the proposed change would um, confirm that the Title IX regs apply to sexual orientation and, and gender identity related um, discrimination. I think that we interpret the current regs even as also covering those topics and that certainly I think OCR would take any complaint. Um, I mean, that's what their, their, their guidance and, and, and notice of interpretation is of the law. So I don't see that as too much of a major shift. It does though um, confirm, remember parents have robust rights to information through this process. So it, um, requires when we're dealing of complaints about sexual orientation, discrimination, or bullying around that area, we have to have some transparent and and sometimes um, hard conversations where you may be telling parents your child's being bullied. We think it's because of sexual orientation. We need to identify that that's, that's behind it in order to make sure we're following the correct process. So that's just one thing to flag, especially if these new regulations were to be confirmed, but I think is even true under the current. Um, anything, Amy or Caitlin or James or Adam that jumps out at you as far as where we are in the, the process and waiting game? Well, I would just hope if the final rules are out this summer, that at least we have the opportunity to learn about them and 
prepare for implementation when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic, figuring out how we're going to open schools like we were with the August 2020 regs. That's a great, great point and hope to put out there in the universe, Caitlin. And, and I will <laughs> say, you know, as I recall from, you know, when the previous regs were put in, or the current regs were put in place, there was a waiting time. So once the final regs were issued, then they did not, they were issued, I think in May, they didn't take effect until August. So, you know, we would, um, you know, hope slash expect that that would be the case as well, so that there's time for, for, for all of us to get our heads around, you know, what are, what is actually going to be required before it's actually required to be implemented. Great. Well, thank you. And so one other thing I just wanted to slip in, my colleagues um, didn't necessarily give me license to talk about this, but I wanted to say one, um, this isn't really an update, but one thing in my practice that I've lesson learned about the current regs that I think might be helpful, and that is lean in hard on that informal resolution option. It's one of those things where I almost think the exception overtakes the rule. You're, it's, it's the, the actual Title IX grievance process is so burdensome. But I think, you know, you can expertly use that informal resolution process to come out with a good outcome for both complainants and respondents. So that's just one thing I want to throw out there, even though it's it's not really an update. It's been around from since 2020. But the other update I did want to highlight, and remember, Title IX applies both to students and staff. So we're talking about, you know, human, human uh, issues, not just uh, dictated by uh, a status necessarily, but one of the interesting uh, new guidances to come out has been in the wake of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, you may have been uh, cognizant of the administration putting out various guidance documents after that to try to um, strengthen protections in any way they could from an administrative lens. And they did this in the area of Title IX and pregnancy, or pregnancy termination, which would include pregnancy termination or, or abortion protections. And so that, that's one thing that has come out recently that, that's interesting. And you should both have in your mind for employees uh, and, and students. And where I think that OCR would be particularly um, delighted might be too strong of a term, but if they got a pregnancy you know, discrimination complaint, it would align with what they're trying to message to make sure that people fully understand these protections. And so it would be bad timing right now to have a uh, pregnancy discrimination issue co come up. And certainly we want to be extra. I mean, you always want to comply with all laws, but this one should be it, clearly in your radar right now. And really what that means when we're talking about pregnancy discrimination, one, discrimination and exclusion. So where we would treat uh, pregnancy different than other times, types of te temporary illness um, when it comes to being excluded from employment or school. And even at the high school level, you know, we see this in higher ed a lot, but I see high schools and their, their semester calendars and just the rhythm of the school year being somewhat rigid when it comes to dis, things like disability and pregnancy. So it would be bad, for example, to suggest to a student, why don't you just sit out a semester? Your pregnancy doesn't align very well with how we, we issue credits, you know, and no point in you coming this semester because you're gonna be out for your pregnancy. Um, something like that is where I feel like we get in a lot of trouble or, or maybe the well-intended, um, the well-intended, you shouldn't participate in the activity. You shouldn't have that, do, take on that work responsibility because you're going to be, you know, too, too burdened by your pregnancy. So don't worry about participating in our activities or that employment opportunity. Those kind of well-intended sometimes, but exclusionary comments are where we often see uh, uh, pregnancy discrimination. Um, the same, you know, they also highlight medical and, and benefits or services. Again, we wanna make sure we're very consistent. And then the leave policy that, that we're not requiring something different um, for pregnancy, uh, pregnancy leave that we do for other medical conditions. Keeping in mind though, even if you don't have a leave policy for pregnancy, it's something that you need to afford or make available um, 
if it, if it happens and, and work that out uh, regardless of maybe how you treat other things because it is certainly something that you need to accommodate. Um, with that, you know, again, my recent experience, which is probably why I was drawing from that semester issue, is of uh, the um, the kindly intended but um, ill-informed and frankly discriminatory uh, exclusion of a, a pregnant student from from opportunities. I don't know if any of you have seen examples or, or red flags that you want to alert people, make sure to avoid <laughs> avoid this kind of discrimination. It's out there. Yeah, I would agree with everything you said, Jennifer. I, and I think I've received more calls about pregnant students recently than I have in the past. So I don't know if that just happens to be my personal the calls I'm getting, or that's more of a trend statewide, but I, I think schools should be particularly attuned to this right now because it, it is coming up both for students and, and for staff, of course. With that, okay. yeah, I'll kick it back to you and kick it back to our next, uh, our next presenter. Thank you. I would like to turn it to Amy now. I know, Amy, that school districts around the state are already inundated with training requirements. I know we used to maintain um, a chart of the training requirements, and I think the chart probably overtook itself. It was too long to print. But with that said, we've been talking about a lot of new policy and training requirements uh, under Faith and Aaron's law. So can you talk a little bit about what those requirements are? And particularly, I know we have a, a deadline coming up on January 31st. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, as you mentioned, um, while we do have lots of training requirements, we do try to support you all with those. So um, we do keep up with that on a yearly basis. So let us know if there's additional questions on other training requirements. Um, but I did want to touch on some significant new policy and training requirements that we have this year that were put into place under Faith's Law and Aaron's Law, um, which, as most of you know, um, were, you know, various amendments were made to the school code really to, that were aimed to address sexual abuse prevention and response in schools. Um, and so under these new amendments, particularly um, that, that went into, some that went into effect um, this past summer, um, school districts, charter schools, and non-public schools are required to implement new training policy and procedural requirements this school year. Um, and then there are some additional procedures related to an employee history review and parent notification of sexual abuse abuse reports that will need to be implemented as of July 1st, 2023. So I'm going to just provide a brief overview of the policy and training requirements and, and those other training requirements just to make sure that, that they're on everyone's radar. Um, so first, starting with the policy requirements that went into effect as of July of 2022. I want to first remind everyone of the employee code of professional conduct policy that has to be in place. Um, so the school code now requires of all school districts, charter schools, and non-public schools to develop an employee code of professional conduct policy. Um, and this does have to address specific components. Um, it has to incorporate the code of ethics for Illinois educators that was put out by ISB. It has to incorporate a particular definition of sexual misconduct as it's defined in a particular section of the school code. It has to identify expectations for employees um, regarding how to maintain a professional relationship with students, including specific expectations for staff student boundaries. Some districts and schools may have already had some of these codes of conduct in place in their handbooks or through their CBAs, but not all. So this is um, a significant change in new policy requirement um, that likely, um, you know, those of you who are listening today have been working with your legal counsel and unions to, um, to put in place. The Code of conduct policy does also have to include additional steps as well, you know, references to employee reporting requirements required under ANCRA and Title IX, as well as references to um, required employee training related to child abuse and educator ethics. So in addition to having the employer, uh, the code of conduct policy in place, um, school districts, charter schools, and non-public, non non-sectarian schools have to include a copy of this new policy in any staff, student, or um, school handbook. 
And then school districts, charter schools, and on public schools also have to include a copy of it on their website. So for those of you that have already gotten this policy in place, you want to also make sure that you have a copy of it in your handbooks and website. Um, so if you need to do some sort of, you know, addendum to your handbooks as well to, to make sure that you're compliant with that, then, then you would need to do that as well. Um, you know, those school districts who use press policies have likely, again, been working already with legal counsel um, and your unions to update your press policy 5120 and related procedures to comply with this requirement. Um, again, charter schools and private schools must also adopt policies meeting this requirement and then have those included in your appropriate handbooks as well. We do have and have been working with schools um, to provide recommended language and sample policy language to help support schools in meeting this requirement. So do reach out if you are looking for assistance with that. Um, in addition to those requirements under Aaron's law, all school districts this year have to provide in their school handbooks, so likely a parent, student, family handbook, um, evidence-informed educational information on the warning signs of a child being abused, along with any needed assistance, referral, or resource information. Um, so that's something that if you haven't already done so, to review your handbooks to ensure that you do have that necessary language in there as well. Um, we do have sample handbook language um, to help support schools in meeting this requirement as well. Um, and then finally, from the policy standpoint, all school districts do have to adopt and implement a policy addressing sexual abuse of children that has to include particular components required under the school code. Likely everybody has, excuse me, likely everyone has this updated um, if you do subscribe to press policy 4165. Um, and that's going to be, um, if you subscribe to the press policies, that's the policy number that it's likely going to be in. Um, if not, or if you're not sure whether yours has been updated, um, you should review that policy. And if it hasn't been updated recently, then to work with your legal counsel to get that updated. And then as Caitlin mentioned, um, under um, Aaron's law, we do have a new annual training requirement for all school personnel at school districts that does now have to occur by January 31st of each year, um, including the school year. So by January 31st of each year, school districts must now provide training for all school personnel on child sexual abuse including evidence-informed training on preventing, recognizing, reporting, and responding to child sexual abuse and grooming behavior. The training does have to specifically address when the grooming or abuse is committed by a member of a school community with a discussion of criminal statutes related to sexual conduct between school personnel and students. The training also has to cover professional conduct and reporting requirements, as well as a few other requirements that are spelled out in the school code. So again, this is a new annual requirement for all school personnel and does have to occur by January 31st of each year. We will be offering training after the new year to help districts comply with this annual training requirement for those that are interested in or in need of that support. So do please feel free to reach out to us if you are interested in that support, um, as well as any support with the policy requirements I mentioned. And then um, very briefly, um, the two additional requirements that I mentioned earlier that will go into place in um, effective Jan July 1st of 2023, um, are a new employee history review, as well as a parent notification procedure that's required to be in place. Um, effective July 1st of 2023, the employee history review is going to be required to be completed for any applicant um, that is attempting to work directly with children um, or students for employment in any public or non-public elementary or secondary school. So this will apply to, again, our school districts, charter schools, non-public schools, and will require schools to confirm if an applicant, that an applicant is not disqualified for employment um, and to complete a particular employee history review that will involve a process of the employee having to confirm through ISB that they are not disqualified and that they have not been the subject of a sexual misconduct allegation um, or if any employment allegation action has been taken against them as a result of a finding 
<clears throat> of sexual misconduct. And then there will be a process as part of that that school districts will have to verify the information that an employee applicant provides, as well as to likely be providing verification information to schools regarding any of their former employees. There's a lot to unpack with this new requirement. Um, and so James and Adam will actually be leading a, a webinar as well as potentially with some, some of our other um, colleagues and those of us from Franzic um, later this winter or early spring to really break down what these requirements are and to help prepare you for meeting those um, for any new hires after July of 2023. Um, and then there will also be additional guidance that we'll be providing on this new requirement for school districts to develop procedures to notify parents um, with whom a of students with whom a district employee may have been alleged to have engaged in sexual misconduct and when any formal action is taken related to that. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Adam um, for any updates on men a mental health legislation that um, has recently been put out. So Adam, can you turn it, can you give us an overview of that? Well, I'm going to, so I'm going to jump first to the labor stuff here mm -hmm. and talk about a couple of trends that we've seen both nationally and across the state and kind of what it means for us at the table and those of us who are dealing with unions on a pretty much daily basis, right? So I think, you know, our, our Frantic has put out some materials on National Labor Relations Board cases recently. Um, one particularly that I found pretty interesting that relates to dues checkoff provisions. And now, you know, the NLRB, which doesn't really affect most of our public sector uh, school district clients, but has said, look, you know, this dues checkoff ruling that was in place under Trump, under the Trump administration is now we're going to reverse it and go back to how it was under Obama. It just shows kind of the, the wins behind a Democratic administration, right, in terms of labor and how they're gaining momentum, both union organizing um, before the NLRB, before the IELRB. Obviously, we're in a blue state that you know, has a strong labor presence as it is, but we're starting to see kind of, hey, there's some momentum here that, has, that unions are really relying on when they're coming to the table, both nationally, but also showing their members, hey, during COVID, we were there for you, right, in a lot of ways. We've gotten many laws changed, as we all know on this call, the COVID-19 paid administrative leave law, the reinstatement of sick leave, the laws that just came out of the spring 2022 legislative session that address employee shortages. So there are many things that unions are doing to help their members. That's that's clear. And they have an administration per the NLRB that's behind them in their efforts. And so we have that right on top of that. We also have the kind of macroeconomic inflationary pressures that we're all dealing with at the table. And how do we address that? Right. And you know, by paying higher rates in this hot job market, many economists would probably say we're helping inflation, you know, stay where it's at, right? But so we have that. And then on top of all that, we also have a board election year. So there's many issues that are at play when we're dealing with these unions. And what are some of the things we're seeing on a daily basis? Well, for me personally, over the last year or so, I've seen a lot of midterm bargaining, right? where either the unions come to us or our clients have gone to the union and said, hey, look, we want to open up a specific provision of this contract, whether it's the starting salary, right? That was hot last spring. We want to attract teachers in this shortage. We want to um, attract teachers who we can't find, right? We want to find those hard to fill positions. How do we do that? We want to attract our neighbors' teachers, right? How do we do that in terms of um, perhaps getting out of those caps that we have on experience credit. And when we do those types of things, those trigger even more issues that, that I'm sure people on this call are probably nodding their heads. Like, because some of our older teachers, more experienced teachers, they're feeling they're getting jumped in these situations, right? If we're moving people along, giving them more experience credit, hey, what about us, right? And then now you're taking care of another group of teachers. And then we also have unions who don't want to take care of just a select group of teachers. So we're, we're facing those pressures at the table as well, right? There's that. And then in terms of successor bargaining, right? 
I have a lot of clients who want to begin successor bargaining earlier, right? Typically, it starts in the spring. Sometimes it carries over. There's a hiatus period. Clients don't want that, right? We want to know in the spring, what are, what's our salary? What's our starting salary going to be? What are we going to be paying folks so they don't leave? Right? What are we going to be able to incentivize for the new teachers to come to us so that we can address these things kind of at the outset in the spring prior to the fall when we're scrambling to conclude a, an agreement and hire at the same time? So I, I've seen a lot of that as well. Within the bargaining agreement itself, there's a lot of dynamics at play given the factors I kind of talked about earlier. You know, a lot of longevity stipends we're looking at now or retention bonuses because for so long clients have wanted to shift retirees or those close to the retirement date off the salary schedule they're the most expensive right we'll replace them with cheaper teachers that isn't necessarily as easy these days right and so what do we do to keep those teachers our veteran teachers in place if we're not able to hire those new teachers Right. So we're looking at longevity bonuses. We're looking at sweetening the pot in terms of maybe their post retirement health insurance because their pension isn't going as far when inflation seven, eight percent. So we're looking at some of those things as well. The, in terms of the, the new employees, some of the things that I've seen at the table that are creative are, you know, moving allowances for young teachers. Right paying off debt if they acquire tenure, paying off student loan debt, higher starting salaries, obviously, adding perhaps a high deductible insurance option, because as we know, our young teachers don't want to go to the doctor, or don't think they're ever going to have to go to the doctor, just give me the cash, right? So we're looking at some of those things to, re to, a, to re um, really attract some of those younger teachers. And another trend, kind of a third trend before I take up all my time here is, look, we really have to start looking at comparables when our neighboring districts, I know at the table, a lot of times we've been pushing that off. I think now we need to look at it a little bit more, especially in areas where districts are, are stealing each other, right? Stealing each other's teachers, which is becoming more and more common. We really have to look at, hey, what is the total compensation that our neighbors are offering, right? Whether TRS is picked up, what is the insurance contribution, employer versus employee? What does the plan design look like? We really need to make sure that we're competitive versus our neighbors. So we're not losing our teachers to someone that's a mile away. We shouldn't be doing that, right? So I think some of those, those things we're seeing more and more of. Um, and, you know, I don't know, James, if you want to hop in, I don't want to eat into your time. I know we're, we're getting close to the end point here, but go ahead, sir. You're muted. Adam, you laid out a lot of specific examples there. I, I, I'll paint it maybe with a little bit broader of a stroke. I, I think one thing we've learned post uh, pandemic or at least post employment pandemic is the need to be more nimble and flexible um, with our labor negotiations. And I think one of the challenges with that is overcoming inertia and overcoming the history of labor negotiations for a lot of our clients. Uh, you know, unions tend to want to bargain on behalf of the whole group. We're finding ourselves due to some of those economic pr pressures and outcomes from COVID that we need to be more flexible with particular portions of the workforce. We're seeing particular pockets of hard to staff um, positions, whether that's special ed teachers, social workers, uh, SLPs, counselors, psychologists, uh, maybe librarians. Um, and, and the need to maybe go in with a scalpel for negotiating. And that really presents a, a challenge for our union counterparts who historically are used to negotiating on behalf of the entire unit. I mean, if you look at what the salary schedule model is, it, it's really not providing um, incentives or compensation based upon individual needs. It's more of the broader workforce approach. And so I, what I offer here is that if we think we can come to the table, whether it's midterm bargaining or, or your contract is up for, um, for renewal otherwise, to suggest or to think that the employer doesn't have to appreciate the challenges that the union team has on their end in negotiating some of the specific requests, I think that would be naive of us uh, on the management side. 
I think understanding those relationships and, and the challenges that the union faces when it comes to that is important to achieving the result that management would like to achieve. Um, but with that, let me step kind of away from the bargaining table and talk about a, a case that the U.S. Supreme Court has granted certiorari in uh, this last fall. And while it's a National Labor Relations Board um, issue that affects primarily the private sector, and that might trickle down to some of the charter schools or private uh, school administrators that are uh, attending our webinar today. Um, the, the broader stroke of the case has implications, I think, for uh, K-12 public schools as well. And so the case is Glacier Northwest Incorporated versus International Brotherhood of Teamsters. And, and the facts of the case are, are pretty colorful and they're, they're fun to talk about. What it was is it was a, a material supplier for a construction company. And Glacier Northwest provides concrete, you know, to pour footings and um, foundations for construction. And they were in the midst of bargaining that the contract had expired and bargaining broke down. And finally, the union said, OK, we're going to we're going to exercise our our strike notice. We're, we're going to go out on strike. And so literally in the middle of the day, the union leadership walks out and they give notice to all of their members. We're going on strike. They kind of give the you know negotiations are over. We're on strike. And they literally called cement trucks that were out for deliveries to various construction projects back to the yards. And what happened when, when the strike began is you had some employees coming back and giving their you know, management or their bosses notice, hey, we didn't make the delivery because we're on strike now. You've got a, a truck full of, of uh, cement that's wet that's going to be needed to be taken care of. Some left their trucks running, some shut them off, and some didn't tell their bosses at all about the cement sitting in this truck. And what happens, I mean, we've all seen those big barrels that have to keep rolling to keep the cement from drying and, and spoiling. Uh, six, somewhere between 16 and 20 of those trucks, the cement was spoiled. And that not only damaged the barrel of the truck itself, but it also was a loss of the product. And so the, the company itself had hundreds of thousands of dollars of losses. And after the strike was settled and, and the contract was settled, the company brought an action for conspiracy against the union and these workers for loss of the property. And they were just simply seeking to recover the funds. They filed the lawsuit in state court. This is in um, the state of Washington. And the union immediately filed a motion arguing this is a labor matter. It all concerns the strike. This is not a case that should be decided by state courts. It should be removed to the National Labor Relations Board because this is covered by national labor law. The reason why the union wants to take that approach is because national labor law and even local labor law here in Illinois generally does not provide for monetary damages when there's a wrong, when there's a violation of the act. And that's why the union wants to move it there. At best, you know, they'll get a notice that there's been an unfair labor practice that's been committed, you know, peg the notice to uh, the bulletin board and, and send it out to all of the workforce. The, the nerdy kind of legal implications of that case is all about whether national labor law preempts these state uh, tort cases. That's not why the case is important to uh, schools here in Illinois. The reason why it may be more important is it goes to the issue of how far are the courts going to allow management or employers to protect losses that come in the midst of a strike. And so if we translate that to education, there is a litany of losses that can happen when teachers or support staff decide to go out on strike. You know, we have loss of education. We have potentially the need to make up those lost days later in the school year. And so now we have an impact on the school calendar. We have impact on the community. We have potentially vacations that'll have to be canceled or um, you know, educational programs that perhaps the staff were going to attend that are gonna be infringed upon if school now needs to be extended into the first or second week of June due to a strike during the school year. And so we have a case here in Illinois that speaks specifically to this issue that the Illinois Edu Educational Labor Relations Board just decided a few weeks ago. And that involved a strike that a teacher's union had implemented back in 2018. And the, the teachers went out on strike for five days. And ultimately, the party settled the agreement, allowing for just one of the five days to be made up. The board took the position, we're not going to allow 
the union to make up all five days. There's there's too much of an impact on the community. And, you know, essentially it was part of their economic bargaining with, with the four days that were not made up. Those were economic savings that the board was able to use to put a little bit more on the table to settle the strike for the teachers. So even though the teachers union signed off on the agreement, it was you know fairly negotiated late into the night, six months after the contract uh, was finalized, this particular IEA local filed an unfair labor practice with the labor board here in Illinois, arguing that the board's position that it would only make up one of the five strike days was a violation of the Labor Act. It essentially was discrimination or retaliation against the union membership for engaging in protected rights, concerted rights that are protected under the Labor Act. And as Adam mentioned, you know, Illinois is a fairly stable uh, state when it comes to labor negotiations. We don't have locally um, some of the, the risks that nationally uh, private employers have to uh, encounter uh, when it comes to the prevailing headwinds of, of politics, whether it's a Republican administration or a Democrat administration um, in placing members on the National Labor Relations Board. Here in Illinois, we know that the state is fairly union friendly, but the Labor Board in, in Illinois issued a decision that said, union, you're wrong. It was a fairly negotiated contract, and you're not suggesting that it wasn't. And the fact that the deal was struck between both parties and not unilaterally imposed, imposed by the Board of Education suggests that there is no adverse employment action here. And therefore, the board can't be held responsible for the risk that the union took in going on strike, but not having all five of the strike days made up. And we've seen this trend over the last few years um, in strikes in the at least the northern half of the state. Um, you know, CPS had a, a pretty well reported strike a couple of years ago where they were the teachers were on strike for 11 days, but only five of the 11 days were made up. Um, There's another school district up in the northern suburbs did something similar. And what we're seeing based upon this decision is upholding the Board of Education's leverage when it comes to the economic principles at the table. Because our Labor Act does not ensure that striking employees will have those days made up. That is the risk that the union takes in going out on strike. And the board's leverage is to bring them back into the workforce with a short amount of a strike. And if the board were to be forced to make up those days, they would lose that leverage. And the labor board just was not gonna go there. So it's a good decision in Illinois for school districts. It's a positive decision for employers. And it, it's important that we share that with you. And then, you know, if you're facing a potential strike or threat of a strike at the table, that um, that you have that leverage kind of in your hip pocket. So we want to leave some time for questions today. So I'll let our moderators uh, bring us back to a QA. and a Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, we do have some time here at the end for questions about 10 minutes. I know there are a few we've received throughout. So I would ask my co-presenters, are there any of these questions? It looks like we've got a couple questions on the Faith's Law and Aaron's Law updates and a couple questions on the stick, sick leave reinstatement law based on, uh, that came out of COVID. Does anyone wanna tackle those questions? I, I, I can jump in. Go ahead, go ahead, Amy, go ahead. All right, and then I'll, well, I was just gonna say, and then I'll welcome to anybody else to, to add to it. So I see one question is asking about um, if the references to some of the new laws related to all school personnel include substitutes. Um, so, you know, with regard to the training requirement, um, it's school personnel are required to be trained. Um, it's, it doesn't go much into that. So, um, you know, we've got this annual requirement. Um, you know, I think looking at that conservatively, that would include those who are employed as substitutes. Um, you know, I think that the spirit of the law is to really ensure that those who are having daily contact with, um, with students are, are trained in order to know to take the, the necessary steps. Um, but that, it, that the terms of the, the statute, um, it's pretty broad in terms of the requirement and doesn't specifically define, um, you know, personnel in that particular training requirement. With regard to the employee history review um, that has to be conducted, um, that 
that does apply to substitutes. However, there is a abridged version of what has to be the, the review that has to be done for, for substitutes um, that I trust that James and Adam will go into more detail with that um, you know, when, they, when they do that webinar. Yeah, that's right. And Amy, if I could just jump in real quick on that training, just to kind of give some uh, perspective to all of our HR professionals that might be on the call. You know, this is going to be a double whammy for school districts because it's not just the hiring school district that's going to have to go through this process. It's the former employer. And because so many school employees move from one school district to another, you know, it, the hiring district's going to have to engage in this background check. And it's the, the districts that the the applicant used to work for has obligations under the law to respond to these forms and questionnaires and to provide data and, and paperwork to the hiring district. So it, it's really going to hit our, our school district and, um, and, and charter school clients on both fronts, not just the hiring side. Yeah. And James, we did have another question about the review regarding whether it applies to volunteers that aren't directly employed by the organization. So I know it does apply to, uh, you know, it's pretty heavy, uh, the statutory requirement on, on employee and applicants for employment. It does apply, as I know you both will talk about in the webinar, to um, contractors um, and those who are employed with contractors. Um, but in terms of volunteers, I think that's, um, it doesn't explicitly say that they are encompassed in there, but I think you'll talk more about that, I'm sure, as to whether to include them or not. We will, and, and I agree, it does not specifically address volunteers. In, in terms of the sick leave question about whether the sick leave reinstatement, that only applied to the 21-22 school year, again, for vaccinated staff, but there was the paid administrative leave that so long as the governor has his disaster pocket proclamation in effect, which he just reauthorized December 8th, that continues to go. So you only look back for 21-22. Going forward, it's still there for the time being. Hey, and we've had a couple of additional questions trickle in. Um, one of them is whether the GCN module on Faith's Law, Grooming, and Sexual Misconduct is legally compliant. Uh, I personally have not had an opportunity to see the, the GCN module. I don't know if any of my colleagues here have, but I, I do know that we will be doing a training that we believe is legally compliant, certainly. <laughs> um, so that's another option. Any, anything to add? Has anybody seen the GCN? I haven't. I'll just add that, um, you, you know, there has been training requirements on this topic generally in place, but this particular requirement, um, you know, is new with some particular components that have to be included in the training. Um, so I do think it is important for those who have been providing um, training on this topic generally to either some or all of your staff in past years, that it's going to be really important to look at what's been provided and make sure it's actually uh, meeting of the statute, which we, of course, can, you know, help with. Uh, we're seeing lots of questions on, on the new uh, background check information that's uh, required for new hires. Uh, there's a question here, does this impact private employers? What if a school district hires, for example, food service that came from a private catering company or, or McDonald's or somewhere else? Will they have to comply with requests for background information, background uh, employment history? So the answer is yes. Um, as schools, we have to request that information from those private employers. And yes, the law does require those employers to provide the information to us. And, and we'll get into this into the training that we're going to do in a couple months. Um, however, the law doesn't have any apparent enforcement mechanism for it. So it's not exactly clear if, say, a private employer doesn't respond to a school district's request for background information, what that means for the employer. Um, I have a personal thought that there could be potential liability there, that this law is designed to protect kids. It's designed to prohibit or, or stop further perpetration of sexual assault on kids. And if we have a private employer or any kind of employer who's not cooperating with this exchange of information like the law requires, that's going to put them in a position of liability. Um, but that's the best we have so far. There, there doesn't seem to be any other enforcement mechanism in the law. Yeah. But yeah, lots of questions around this subject. So stay tuned for that training and webinar. Yep. And I see that we got even just another question. If ISBE has made any progress on the forms that are going to be needed to use to, for that check, since that is part of that. James and I were just discussing this. Um, 
we have we are anxiously awaiting that. Um, I haven't seen that yet, and and hopefully we'll have some movement on that by the time we revisit this with the webinar. But certainly we'll be looking out for that, um, and 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 be ready to to alert everyone through our alerts um, and guidance to all of you on that topic when we see every anything that comes out. Um, so with that, I don't see any additional questions that have come in, but again, by all means, we know that a lot of what we've discussed today um, may raise questions for you and your staff, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, thank you again for joining us today, and we do wish all of you a very restful holiday break and look forward to seeing you in the new year. Take care. Thank you.